question is the question of how do we get food? Uh, this is a universal question that all cultures uh, have to ask and answer. They will organize uh, their uh, society, their members of their society into ways to facilitate the gathering of food or the production of food. Uh, men and women will be given their various duties. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, out of it all will come a fairly productive lifestyle. And here is a shot from a Donny feast. Uh, here, I, women are opening up a steam pit. If you've ever been to Hawaii, been to a uh, uh, traditional Hawaiian luau, uh, they have uh, the steam ovens in the ground. Here they are, they're opening it up and they're bringing the food out. And uh, when they do have uh, a feast like this, uh, if it is a, uh, a really important feast, it will definitely serve uh, pork because this was the main uh, domesticated animal among the Western Donnie. And uh, here they are uh, butchering it in a very uh, traditional South Pacific style. It is not at all like we would do in America. It is butchered in such a way that it, the meat can lay out flat and be exposed to the hot rocks that will be part of the steamer. Of course, sometimes in the culture, it's not a question of how do we get our food, but how do they get their food? And here you see a Alaskan kayaker paddling for his life as a whale comes up for a bite. Um, is this a real shot? Is this a Photoshop? I'll uh, let you figure that one out. Uh, but the information I got was, oh, this was a real event uh, and it really did happen. Uh, but here's Alaska version of Noah and um, well, we'll see. He made it, by the way. Uh, well, systems of food production. That's our topic for today. Now, not every culture uses the same strategies for producing food. And what we want to do is put today's discussion in the broader framework of cultural studies. We've got our little chart again. Remember we talked about at the beginning of the, of the class how we would be talking about the various components of culture. You, the outside circle was worldview. We've already talked about worldview. Now we're starting to make our way around the inside uh, slices of pie, if you would. And over here on the left at the top is production systems. That will be our topic of discussion for this week. How do people get the food that they need to keep themselves healthy? As we talk about this, we notice from Genesis chapter 1, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it and give I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. This was God's commandment to us to go out, to be fruitful and to increase in numbers. How have we fulfilled that basic biblical commandment? We've got several levels. Less complex cultures tend to do what we call hunting and gathering. The early inhabitants of the Garden of Eden were gatherers. I won't put them into the hunting category because we have no evidence of hunting until after the fall. But in any case, they are eating from the seed bearing plants on the face of the earth. So hunting and gathering is the first most widespread form of 
food gathering. Then we start developing what is called nom nom nomadism uh, or a nomadic lifestyle. And here you have the raising of large herds. And then you move more into agriculture in its many variations. So we're going to plot our way through each one of these stages because anthropology is as concerned about food gathering techniques in advanced societies as much as they are with less advanced societies. Because each one of them has implications for how societies are organized, how it affects human behaviors. It will also affect the ecology of the region. So let's take a look, first of all, at hunters and gatherers. What is life like in a hunting and gathering lifestyle? Now, there are a couple of variations to what we want to use <clears throat> when it's referring to a hunting and gathering lifestyle. Sometimes textbooks will refer to hunting and gathering lifestyles as foraging lifestyles. I use the term quite synonymously, foraging or hunting and gathering. What is life like for people who live in such societies? First of all, life for a foraging culture exists in what we would call a band level of social organization. People live in small groups. You do not have large concentrations of people living off of foraging. You have just a small band of people, maybe a dozen, maybe a couple of dozen, seldom much larger than that. And there's a reason for that, because these are people who are going to live off of eating food that grows naturally in the wild. So they will go to an area, uh, and if it is, um, if it is uh, the fall and you have a lot of, uh, of uh, fruits that are available, uh, blueberries, for instance, you could have a blueberry festival. You could have uh, folk eating a lot of blueberries or other kinds of berries. Uh, if, uh, if it is uh, a time when uh, wild turnips are finally coming into full production, they will be digging the, the turnips up out of the ground. Uh, this is a time when they go around looking for the natural product of the soil and of the trees that come with the seasons. Now, when you saw the, f the picture of uh, the, uh, the hunters, one of the things you saw were the women going out looking for mongongo nuts. Now, mongongo nuts, are uh, they're a tuber, uh, and the women would go out and they would look for a place where uh, there was evidence of a mongongo nut. They would dig it up. Uh, they would test it to make sure that it was uh, ready to be uh, harvested. They would put it into their bags, bring it back, and that would provide the evening meal for the rest of the people. Now, did you notice how the, the weir, as they called it, the, the little band that got together uh, was very, very small, just half a dozen families. Uh, and there, the reason for it is because if you have too many people, you quickly eat up all of the natural uh, food that's available and then you are hungry. So they will have small bands, they will live uh, very, very diversified areas and they will begin to hunt out or to, to, to gather out all of the uh, local roots, fruit, trees, whatever. Now there was a band of uh, foraging people who lived uh, north of where I lived in the highlands. When we went down into the region, these were a foraging culture who lived in what we Westerners called the Lakes Plains region. It was a huge, massive mango swamp. And the primary means of transportation in the mango swamp uh, was on uh, canoes. 
and the, the folk would go up and down the rivers on their canoes and they would look for uh, uh, fruit or tree products that they could uh, harvest for food. And one of their primary sources of food was what we would call breadfruit. Now breadfruit is usually a huge, uh, it's not exactly like a ball, it's more like a, um, like a bag, but it would be at least the size of a basketball, but usually a little bit longer, very knobbly on the outside. And they would do everything they could to get up into a tree and to cut one of those uh, breadfruit down. And then they would break it up and uh, you could either eat it raw or you could roast it. And, and it was filled with all these little uh, uh, nutty uh, uh, fruit in there, or, well, nuts. <laughs> it's not a fruit at all, although it's called breadfruit. Uh, but they had the, this nutty uh, pulp in there and you could eat that. And it wasn't half bad. It wasn't, well, do you know what Brazil nuts look like? Well, then don't use that as an illustration. Uh, it's, uh, um, the, the nut would be, would be maybe the size of your thumb. And, uh, and uh, you would chew away on that. Uh, I preferred it uh, uh, roasted rather than raw, but it wasn't half bad. It's rather uh, unsatisfying if that's all you're eating, but it is a good source of nutrition and people who live by it would go up and down the rivers looking for these uh, uh, breadfruit to come into season and uh, would eat it. They would also live by hunting and they would hunt uh, the livestock or the, the wildlife in an area. Uh, if it was, uh, we didn't have in our part of, of uh, the South Pacific, we didn't have monkeys, so they couldn't go monkey hunting, but we could go hunting for cassowary birds. You would go hunting for wild boar. Uh, you would go hunting for a number of varieties of uh, game birds. Uh, and they would try to hunt these out. And, uh, and in other regions, they would hunt wild animals, uh, gazelles, uh, wild deer, other kinds of animals in the South or in South America, they would go hunting uh, monkeys and uh, and other wildlife. And uh, once they've kind of hunted it out, then it's time to break camp and move to a different location. So mobility was a major part of the lifestyle of people in a foraging lifestyle. They would have a small band. They would harvest the food in a region. They would hunt out the game in the region. When it became too difficult to get food, when it would appear that they had hunted out most of the game or driven it off, then it was time to break camp and move to another location. And so the foraging lifestyle meant that you were constantly mobile. That meant you did not build permanent dwellings. It meant that you had to be highly mobile. You did not have a lot of things that you would own. You did not make stuff that you had to carry. You tried to be as portable as possible so that you could change your location. Now, the uh, a prime example of a, a foraging culture are the Plains Indians of North America. And the Plains Indians of North America were a highly mobile uh, bands of people. They moved all around. They would follow the buffalo and they would hunt the buffalo. They would uh, hunt uh, or try to gather uh, food from, from uh, the ground and uh, kept moving all the time. Now, what kind of housing did the Plains Indians have. They had what we would refer to today as teepees. These were these highly mobile uh, homes that you could, you could uh, throw up the, uh, uh, the poles, you could throw a canvas around it, and you could have a house set up uh, very, very quickly, and you could live there. And when you had hunted out 
the food in that location or the buffaloes had moved on, you could then dismantle it. And once they discovered the ability to use horses, horses were introduced into the plains uh, by the Spanish. Once the uh, Plains Indians became familiar with horses, were able to use them for their own purposes, they developed uh, the uh, uh, travois, the, the uh, platforms that they could uh, hook up to a horse and they could drag it on the ground and that could help them to carry a bit more of their goods. Uh, and so it allowed them then to carry their teepees with them uh, in, the, uh, in the fashion that allowed them to move more material goods and particularly their furs. Well, uh, this is typical of these cultures. They are constantly moving and finding uh, game or food that is available. They also had a great need to be able to meet with other people who shared their cultural traditions. They needed time to come together for what we would call congregation and dispersal. They would come together to meet with other bands, other bands that spoke uh, their language, shared their cultural tradition, other bands with whom their children could find uh, husbands and wives. So you have the disparate bands coming together for times of community. Women will sit around and talk about their families, their children, about life in general. Young couples will go around flirting, looking for prospective husbands or wives. Uh, men will sit around and talk about uh, game, hunting, experience with hunting. They will talk about the dangers of uh, surrounding uh, tribes. Uh, it's a time for becoming much more acquainted uh, with the broader knowledge and experiences of the rest of the people with whom you identify. Now, this congregation and dispersal actually took place in that movie you were watching on the hunters. You have this small band with a few families and they're finally able to kill that giraffe. They now have an abundance of meat. So what happens? Other bands, word goes out to the other bands, come on on in. We've got uh, extra food, we want to distribute it. And so they all come together, they all uh, begin to share the food, and eventually they will break up and head off to their various uh, areas of, of the Kalahari Desert where they live. So they come together, they break up and they go apart. This was very typical of Native Americans on the plains. If you saw uh, Dances with Wolves, that movie, you saw that very, very large Native American village. That is not a typical band. These are folk who have come together because they are looking for uh, the last chance to, uh, to pull the uh, buffalo hides together to get a winter supply of food before they will disperse and go their various ways. And if you will recall, uh, the American uh, soldier that's involved in that story uh, joins them then as they head off to their winter quarters, breaking up into bands again, and they're going to head north. Actually, they're going to go up uh, leave the Dakotas and head into Canada where the uh, Calvary will not be able to get him. But you get this congregation and dispersal as a way of life. The other thing that we notice that's very important is that both men and women share in collecting food. Men and women share in collecting food. In a foraging culture, women are as important 
maybe even more important than men because they have the key responsibility of bringing in the product of the soil, the fruits, the vegetables, whatever else it is, that is part of the staple diet of the people of the village. Now, for a healthy body, you have to have two distinct components. You have to have calories. You get calories from fruits and vegetables. So, you can be a vegetarian, you can, you can survive fairly well if you eat properly as a vegetarian because you get the basic calories that you need. You must get several hundred calories per day. As a matter of fact, depending on how big you are, probably up to around 2,000 calories just to keep the old body warm. All right? You go below that, you're going to be going on to a very strict diet. You go above that, you go for uh, a nice evening meal at a cheesecake factory, and you can get your 2,000 calories just in a piece of cheesecake. Forget the rest of the meal. You've had the whole day's portion just in one piece of cheesecake. But you do need those calories. Can you live on calories alone? And the answer is no. You must have the second component, that's protein. We all have to have protein. Now, if you are a vegan or a vegetarian, you have to get your protein from something other than animal products. You have to get it from, uh, from a, a nut product or you have to get it from uh, soybean or, uh, or other nutritional supplements. But you must have protein. So you've got this balance between protein, which most often comes from meat, and calories that most often comes from fruits and vegetables. The women in foraging societies tend to bring together the calories. The men tend to bring in the protein. So let's look at the quality of life that comes about from living in a foraging culture. Now we've been talking about food requirements. We've talked about the need for calories and protein. Well, Based on a study of the Kung San people, the ones that we saw in the movie, male hunters supplied 800 calories of meat for every band member in their little weir for every hour that they spent hunting. So if it was a fairly good hunting environment, they would go out and spend an hour hunting well, usually they would spend more like six to eight hours, but they would come back with enough meat to be able to give 800 calories of meat. Now we're talking about calories because you do get calories from the meat. Women, on the other hand, who were out gathering food and nuts, they were able to supply 2,000 calories for every band member per hour of gathering. Now, since you need several hundred calories, who's the most efficient food provider in a foraging culture? It's the women. An hour from a clever woman in, a, uh, in an area that's not been over, uh, overused, she could bring in 2,000 calories for everybody in the band. The men, on the other hand, only bring in 800. But the men are also bringing in protein. So if you look at a diet of nine ounces of mongongo nut and nine ounces of meat, 
This will provide 2,140 calories and 92.6 grams of protein. Now that's just from mongongo nut and wild game. And what do the kung need? Now these kung are fairly short folk, uh, but the kung minimum daily requirements consist of 1,970 calories and 60 grams of protein. So, a few hours of hunting every day and a few hours of digging in the Kalahari Desert will get enough food to keep the Kung population fed. Now, I didn't say well fed because it means that you're going to be eating mongongo nuts for breakfast. And it means you're going to have mongongo nuts for supper. And for lunch, well, you might have a few berries while you're out in the bush, or uh, as you saw, maybe they'll actually find some little baby birds and they'll be able to throw them into, the, uh, into a pot and boil them into a soup. Doesn't sound very appetizing to me, but you know what? When you are hungry, caterpillars taste mm, scrumptious. And, uh, and uh, well, you know what? We had, uh, we used to, we, when we were living overseas, uh, we would open up a, because uh, 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 we didn't have enough, enough meat locally, every now and again, we would open up a can of, um, Let's see, what would you call it? Spam. I, do, is it spam? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's the, it's the uh, Asian version of, of uh, spam. And we would, we would open up a can of spam and then we would slice it and, uh, and uh, put some sauce on it to give it a little flavor. And that would be the meat that we would eat with our, for our supper. On occasions, we might even go to the extreme of opening up a tin can with hot dogs in it. Now, you've never had hot dogs until you've had hot dogs in a tin. Uh, probably the best way to describe it is don't think of it as a hot dog because it doesn't taste at all like a normal hot dog. Uh, but it was the closest we could get. But they were always packed in water. And one of the things we would do would be to open up the, uh, the tin can and pour out the water. And uh, some of our Donnie help, who worked in the house with us said, Dr. Hayward, well, in those days it wasn't doctor, it was just, it was just two on. They said, don't throw that water away. There are kids right outside playing that would love to drink that water because it's got just enough little residue of nutrition in it that the kids are starving for more protein. So we learn not to throw away what would normally be for us uh, a, a, a byproduct of food. We learn to share it because these were kids who were desperate for more protein. Well, um, so they are able to get enough food. Now, they're not going to get a lot of varieties, but they're going to get sufficient. Now, what happens when it comes to their workload? What is life like in a foraging culture? Uh, what do they have to do to survive? Well, once again, based on the Kung San, uh, Adults constituted about 60% of the population. And uh, the anthropologists who studied the Kung, Sun, uh, uh, Kung San culture uh, calculated the amount of time that people actually spent working and discovered that the average workload was 15 to 17 hours per week. 15 to 17 hours per week. Now, you saw that in that, in that, uh, uh, in that movie. Uh, the guy playing with his kids, 
uh, one of the other young men running back and forth with the kids and playing with them. They have a lot of time to invest in uh, family time. They got a lot of time to invest in, uh, you know, sitting around enjoying life. The average workload is 15 to 17 hours per week. And that's only for 60% of the population. Now, let's compare this to your work week. What's the average work week in the United States? 40 hours, right? 40 hour work week. Do you realize that if all of us would have Abandon the modern lifestyle that we now have, we could cut our work time by more than 50%. Why wouldn't you want to go live in the Kalahari Desert? Well, for that matter of fact, students, you, um, here you are at Biola. Um, What's the average study load for a Biola student? Uh, 15 hours, more or less, 18 hours? Is that what you do? Let's make it 15 hours, because that's simpler math for me. You know, I, you know, I'm an anthropologist, not a mathematician. Uh, so let's say you take 15 hours of coursework uh, per week. That means 15 hours in classes. Now, as one of your professors, I have been told that we are expected to give you two hours of homework for every hour in class. You knew that, didn't you? We're supposed to give you two hours of homework for every hour in class. So if you're spending 15 hours in class, we're supposed to give you 30 hours of homework. You are now up to 45 hours as a full-time student. That's still not half bad. That, you know, that puts you up into the 40 hour a week work schedule. Uh, so, you know, everything's kind of uh, all right. Uh, but I don't know about the rest of you. Um, some of you, I expect, are not getting a free ride. Some of you, I expect, are having to work part-time to help defer the cost of your college education. Uh, I know when I sent my kids off to college, I said, look, room and board tuition, Popsy will pay, but your personal spending money, that's your problem. You wanna party, you wanna buy things, that's on your dime, you gotta work. So we allow you to work part-time along with your 45 hours of schoolwork, but we don't want you to kill yourself. So we put a limit on you. You can only work 20 hours a week, part-time. Well, now you're up to 65 hours, right? So if you are a poor, starving student, like some of us were, you're up to 65 hours of work per week, and that doesn't include all of the other things that you have to do to maintain life, you know, like washing your clothes, uh, uh, taking care of your car, uh, doing whatever else that you've got to do to survive. Uh, you're probably closer to a 75, 80 hour work week. You're insane. Abs Go out and live in the Kalahari Desert on 15 to 17 hours per week. See what I mean? It is not, well, let's not, let's not simplify it too much. Um, let's also talk about the fact that for the young and the old in foraging lifestyle, no work was required of the children. The kids could go out and they could shoot arrows into ant hills. They could set traps to catch uh, mongoose or other little creatures. By the way, didn't you feel kind of bad for that poor old mongoose? You know, 
He's got that thing with the rope around his neck and he's swatting away at it. And, uh, and if any of you have read, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ricky Tiki Tavi, uh, you know, you think of a mongoose as a nice little cute little pet, you know, and to see him swatting that thing and trying to knock it out so they can put it in the pot for, for supper. You know, it's kind of jarring. But in any case, uh, the, kids, uh, the kids are learning how to be adults. They can contribute what they can contribute, but they are not required to. And the old folk, well, the old guys like me, they get to sit around making arrowheads and, uh, and sweeping out the weir and uh, fixing it. Mean, they're, they're just pottering. Uh, it's, the workload falls mainly on the mature adults. So, uh, you know, life in terms of workload capacity is not all that demanding until you start getting an interest on acquiring material goods. Then you're going to run into problems. Well, what about health? What is it like to live in a foraging culture? Don't they have short lifespans? Don't they go to the grave very early? Well, once again, based upon a study of the Kung San, 10% of the population was over 60 years of age. Now, that's not half bad. As a matter of fact, Social Security wouldn't be going bankrupt if it was, you know, just 10% of the population in America. A lot more of us are living beyond 60 years of age, but 10% is not bad. Now, once again, as we look at the population, one of the things that we discover is that population statistics are very low at this upper end. And here's one of the reasons. As I was looking at population statistics among the tribal people with whom I spent so many years, one of the things we discovered was almost half of the children who were born to couples died before the age of five. The first five years of life are very vulnerable times for survival. Young children can become sick very easily and they can die very easily. You know what's the number one killer of infants in the world? Any nurses around here? The number one killer of infants around the world is dehydration, diarrhea. They get, they get distressed gastrointestinal tract, they get diarrhea, they start passing too much fluid through, and they die of dehydration. And that's really, really sad because dehydration can be resolved with sugar water. It doesn't take expensive medicine. Sugar water, several glasses of sugar water given to an infant will reverse the dehydration while they overcome their whatever it is that's causing the diarrhea. But Donny population, approximately half of the children died by the age of five. Once they got past the early stages where they might be vulnerable to uh, diarrhea, the next big transition was being weaned from mother's breast milk. As long as they were on mother's breast milk, they were getting lots of calories, lots of protein. But there came a time when they had to be weaned from that. Now. The Donnie did a very interesting thing. In order to ensure maximum survivability of their children, children were not weaned from their mother's breast until the age of three, sometimes even a bit later. Children nursed for three whole years. And as a matter of fact, in order to ensure that the child had sufficient access to mother's breast milk. Men were prohibited from having sexual intimacies with their wife 
as long as the child was breastfeeding. So they had what we call a postpartum taboo on sexual intercourse. Men could not touch their wives for three years in order to ensure the survivability of their children. After that, as the child was being weaned away from its mother's uh, milk, men could then begin to sleep with their wives and they could start on the process of getting another child. So children were nicely even, evenly spaced every three to four years. Well, what's happening at the end of that three to four year period, the child is getting old enough now, it's starting to get some teeth, it's starting to be able to take some solid foods, but the only solid foods that are available are sweet potatoes. And so the child is having to transition from breast milk to solid food. Now, in order to get enough calories from sweet potatoes to keep your body survivable, I did a study of traditional Donny diets and I began to say to them, how many sweet potatoes do you eat in a day? So we began to put them into a little pile. I discovered that for a Donny man, fully active, a Donny male had to eat approximately five pounds of sweet potatoes every day to get enough calories to be healthy. Have you seen a five pound bag of potatoes? Imagine now eating half of that bag for breakfast and half of that bag for supper, and that's it. Now, I went out to live in the village. I decided I wasn't going to try to live off of a Donny diet, but I had a fellow missionary who said he was going to do that. So he went out to live one week on strictly vegetarian sweet potato diet. He lasted three days and he came dragging back in. I can't do it, I can't do it. So I began to look at, come on, what kind of a wimp is this guy, you know? I bet I could do it. So I went out and, uh, you know, I got this big old sweet potato. Oh man, I scarf that sucker down, mm, that's good. And I realized I gotta eat five of these. I couldn't do it. I mean. I got a big belly now, don't go ahead and make fun. You're laughing. I said, don't, I got a big belly now, but I didn't always have that big <laughs> belly. What I discovered was all the Donny men had actually very large stomachs. They had to have large stomachs. They had to extend them in order to get enough sweet potatoes down to give them the nutritional ingredients that they needed to survive. They could eat two and three times what I could eat and feel quite satisfied by it. So these little boys, these little girls, they have not yet developed the stomach capacity to get enough nutrition, enough calories out of the bulk necessary from sweet potatoes. They're being, uh, uh, weaned away from mother's milk. And what happens? You could look at children about four or five years of age and every one of them would have orange colored hair. Now they're not dying their hair orange colored. What they've got is malnutrition. They're not getting enough nutrition. They're suffering malnourishment. Those kids are hungry. Their hair is beginning to lose its coloration. Their bodies are struggling. That's why so many of these little kids will band together like you saw the Kung San doing and go out and hunt for June bugs to roast in the fire, for caterpillars, for worms, 
My little daughter at that age had some Donny playmates and she would go out with them to play and they would go down to the river and they would find all kinds of bugs and they would gather those bugs and then they would come up and they would drop those bugs onto a hot rock uh, out uh, behind the, our property and uh, pop them like popcorn and then she would eat them along with the kids. She came to love little Golics, as they were called. Uh, and she would come back for lunch and there'd be these brown stains on her hand. What happened there? Oh, I was eating Golics with my friend. They were eating these bugs. Did they like them? Well, you know what? You'll eat anything that brings nutrition, that changes your ability to feel satisfied with your food. But they would get through this period uh, and ultimately get into adulthood. What happens when they get into adulthood? The greatest danger now in adulthood is warfare with her enemy. One out of every five Donny men would die or be seriously injured in battle. So, first of all, you have to survive the nutritional demands of growing up. Then you have to survive the warfare demands of your culture. Finally, when you get into old age, the only thing you've got to survive are the old men's diseases or old women's diseases. You know, cancer, um, uh, blockages, whatever else that comes along with old age. Uh, so, yes, with all of these problems and very low levels of medical assistance, the death rate was incredibly higher than it is for us in more advanced, uh, technologically, medically sophisticated cultures. So the standard was around 50, sometimes lower than that but only because the survivability was so different uh, by age. Let's look at total survival requirements for people living in a foraging culture. Let's look at the biological conditions. When it comes to the things that they need, food, well, even the Kung San on the Kalahari Desert were getting enough food. Sometimes they would go through periods of famine. It happens all the time. Sometimes they would go through periods of a lot of food. When it comes to sex, well, as long as they can maintain a reproduction rate per family of 2.5 people, that's two children to replace mom and dad and another half of a kid on the average, to ensure survivability against uh, uh, future early death, uh, the tribe will be able to grow into uh, a dynamic population. So you look for a reproduction rate of at least 2.5 in order to judge survivability of the culture. Now, this little tribe to the north of us that was a foraging culture. Their survivability was in serious jeopardy. They were not producing enough children to overcome the death rate. There was a reason for that. We'll talk about that at a, a, in a future lecture. But the Dadi were doing quite well with at least a 2.5 survival rate. When it comes to warmth, They've got to have a place to be able to get in and out of the weather. Uh, if the culture is able to provide that, it works out wonderful. When it comes to health, well, they've got to be able to develop standards for combating health issues. Now, the Kalahari inhabitants were able to stay sufficiently apart from one another that major diseases did not spread rapidly. 
The Donnie with whom I worked lived above the malarial level, so they did not have to struggle with malaria. In the malarial regions of Africa, one of the things that we have only lately discovered was early African cultures were able to survive the high mor malaria mortality by living in diversified communities. It was only when the Europeans arrived and built their towns in the high malaria regions along the riverbanks and began to live in concentrated numbers that malaria became a major health problem in Africa. Most of the diversified communities of the pre-contact period had lived in such a way and in such an environment that they were able to develop at least a measure of immunity against malaria. So, uh, health. Health, it is a problem, no question, but it was something they could deal with. Rest, well, they're only working 15 to 17 hours a day, you could survive on that. And when it comes to protection, well, uh, they did need to develop strategies for defending themselves against wild animals or against their enemies. But they could develop these strategies. When it comes to psychological issues, um, every culture has to deal with and Foraging cultures developed this. They had to have an environment that provided love, acceptance, dignity, humor, low stress, and a sense of purpose and achievement. You saw that in the video. You saw how they loved one another, how they gave dignity to one another, even out on the hunt. Nobody criticize somebody else's failure in the hunt. They, they even turn some of it into an occasion for humor. And they're laughing at the poor guy who's got the thorn in his foot. Uh, they, they have this sense of accepting one another's strengths and weaknesses and living around it. So it was a fairly low stress environment. You don't get a lot of pressure to be something that you are not. When it comes to the socio-cultural context, education, children learn by watching. When it came to leadership, they chose the most capable individuals. When it comes to harmony, they learned how to resolve their questions without violence. Order and stability, they moved away from people they couldn't live with. They chose to move in with those that they could. And they took care of one another. They took care of their elders. So, what do we conclude regarding a foraging lifestyle? Was it nasty, short, and brutish? Because some people have described a foraging lifestyle is terrible. Oh, nasty, short, brutish. The answer is no. That is not a good way to characterize a foraging lifestyle. But it wasn't affluent either. It was not the kind of lifestyle that you would enjoy. It is not the kind of lifestyle that uh, you would want to give up everything else and go do. It was an adequate lifestyle. You didn't have a variety of places to go for your meals. You couldn't have pizza today, Mexican tomorrow, baked ham the next day, roast beef the next day, pasta the next day. You did not get a variety of foods. You ate sweet potatoes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You ate mongongo nuts all day long, 24-7. You learned to live with what you had. You did not get, it was monotonous at the least. And it was a fairly adequate lifestyle so long as population 
stayed in balance with the resources. And this is critical because if you start getting too many people, resources will diminish, people will begin to starve to death. So it was a adequate lifestyle. It was perhaps even satisfactory lifestyle, but it was always in tenuous balance with the ecological capacity of the region. Well, um, a new lifestyle began to emerge from those who were engaged in uh, foraging, and that is pastoralism. Now, I've put this little chart on the slide here. This little chart is right out of your textbook, and it shows where pastoral lifestyles tended to emerge. The purple, you see the purple beginning to emerge uh, there in uh, Africa, right through Central Africa, East Africa, and South Africa, which were predominantly cattle regions. Now, this chart represents pastoral lifestyles before the modern era. Obviously now, uh, pastoralism or the raising of cattle is very prominent uh, in North America. And in North America, you start having uh, large uh, cattle ranches and cattle are introduced. All of this is very recent. You had buffalo, but buffalo in the Midwest were never uh, domesticated uh, and they were simply part of a hunting uh, lifestyle. Pre-contact, there it is in the Central East and South of Africa. Then you have the orange uh, categories up there in North Africa. These are predominantly camels and you get some more camels um, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia. So you get the use of camels, raising of camels, and transportation via camels. Over there in South America, down in the uh, Andes, you have uh, llamas or llamas and alpacas. My brother I won't say he owns an alpaca, he has one. He's got a friend who raises uh, alpacas in Canada and uh, she gave him one. And so he kind of helps to support it. Uh, it lives with the other alpaca herd. I don't know, the alpacas live in a herd or a flock or I don't know what it is. Anyway, she's got some alpacas and he just sent me a baby picture. I'll, I probably ought to uh, uh, Photoshop it in and let you see a picture of my brother's alpaca. Uh, they're cute little suckers. Uh, and uh, and uh, every year he helps with the sharing of it and then carting it and making alpaca fur into um, yarn for uh, knitting purposes. And, uh, and so he makes alpaca. Uh, sweaters all winter long uh, after uh, after he's carted all of the alpaca fur. Uh, kind of an interesting guy. Uh, then yaks. Yaks, you got yaks up above India there. Uh, yaks are, uh, again, a domesticated animal. And then you have reindeer way up there in the north, uh, all in the uh, uh, Arctic zones. And then you have the uh, dark blue, which are uh, mixed, where you have sheep, goats, horses, and cattle. And this uh, takes place all through um, China and uh, the Middle East. Well, um, these are regions of the world that have moved into pastoral nomad kinds of lifestyle. Now. There are several things that we want to take note of when it comes to these pastoral lifestyles. When you start raising large herds of animals, when you start having goats, when you start having sheep, 
when you start having cattle. We're not just talking about having one or two. We're talking about having a fairly large herd. One of the things that we discover about herders is that while they do have their herds, they've got their cows, they've got their yaks, they've got their camels, they cannot live off of their herds alone. They cannot live off of simply meat, cheese, or milk. As much as I like cheese, I like to have it with a grilled cheese sandwich. You know, I like some bread with it. How do you get other products to go with your meat? Now, let's go back to that picture back there. North Africa. How many farms are there in the Sahara Desert? Not an awful lot. You cannot grow a lot of food in areas where you raise camels. Down there in South America, how many gardens do you have up in the mountains? Not an awful lot. It's too cold. Uh, over there in the Gobi Desert, some of these other places, you have limited agricultural resources. So one of the things that we discover is that people who raise large herds of animals end up having to trade some of their animals for food or they have to grow food as well as raise animals. And so you get into East Africa. East Africa, you have a lot of um, folk who have cattle farms. As a matter of fact, cattle is very important to East African cultures. Cattle is part of their life. Every cattle, every cow is named. Every cow is owned. Every cow is held in high esteem but they still have to have the women growing food. They still have to have the product of the vegetables and fruit that the women can grow. So pastoral societies are what we call mixed economies. They will grow food for part of their diet and they will raise their animals for part of their diet. And together, they will then be able to provide enough to live on. Now, there's a, there's a marvelous movie about a, a yak society in Tibet. And you, uh, the, the movie, and it's, it's one of those international movies and you've got to, you've got to learn to enjoy the um, uh, reading subscript, but uh, this movie is all about a trading expedition from the mountains down to the lowlands where they can go down because they do not have enough soil to be able to grow enough wheat products to provide them for their trade for the winter. They've got to go down to the lowlands where there is a greater capacity for crops to be able to bring food back on their animals. So what you get here are mixed economies and in order to balance that all out, one of the things they need to do is be in relationship to farmers. So one of the things that's going to happen is you have they're living in these ecologically marginal regions and they're going to have to move their herds 
higher or lower or from region to region depending upon how quickly they will eat out the grasses in the area. And so you get them moving from the high mountains down to the low mountains and then back up into the high mountains during the summer months. And so these are people who are constantly on the move, finding fertile valleys where they can feed their animals and then bringing them back down. So they are going to be nomadic or semi-nomadic. They're going to live in what we would call ecologically marginal regions. It may be too cold, it may be too hot, it may be too whatever. And they will often become traders. They will begin trading their animals or stuff that they can get from one region to another. And so this yak caravan will carry salt down to the lowlands. They will trade salt, maybe even some of their animals for meat, and then come back with grain. So they start trading, especially uh, evident on this is the Silk Route across China, where you have camels moving from one uh, uh, spot to another, trying to find new places for the animals to graze, but at the same time carrying goods from one village to another. Now, the other characteristic of nomadic peoples is their reputation for being aggressive and warlike. Now, this was not always true, but in point of fact, nomadic peoples did not have walled cities to hide behind to protect themselves. They had to become fierce, warlike people who could defend themselves against other marauders. And so they developed this reputation and fostered it. Well, they had to live in harmony with nature. They had lots of time for social interaction and spiritual reflection. Personal spirituality is very important to them because they did not have organized religions. And they were very committed to deep personal loyalties, to covenant promises as part of their continuing relationships. You developed loyal bonds with these people and you never violated it otherwise it was the end of your ability to survive in these kinds of lifestyles. And uh, the realities of their survival were very prominent for them. All right, you wanna go back. I knew you'd wanna go back. All right, there you are. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.